Hi guys, I'm uh, T. Glasgow, I'm an architect, and I'm gonna try not to make this sound like a commercial, but what I do wanna do is hopefully help myself in the future if I am in the opportunity to talk to you firsthand, and that's explain the differences between the architecture we've deployed and many of the other well-known providers of that architecture. Um, what you kind of see here, and um, these numbers, you can take them with a grain of salt, absolutely, but the, the absolute uh, thing you need to recognize is most of us are find ourselves here or have found ourselves here in the past managing an infrastructure for applications that expect that infrastructure to be highly available, resilient, um, and high performance as well as secure. Um, taking it from on-premises to off-premises for many people has been a uh, in some cases has been, if they're, if they're very interested in adopting, has been very easy. Um, for those that can't get good alignment between departments, that's been creating more bumpiness. But the end result is all enterprises are going through a change and their applications are going to, going to fall into one of these categories. And inevitably, most of us have heard of a certain software, soft drink vendor uh, that makes a soft drink. What do you want in the South, for example, when you want to go get a, a soft drink for your family, your friends? Go get a Coke, first to market, right? First to market means I always think of them. Well, many of these software vendors have been first to market and they've, they're, they've been very widely adopted. These are what we would term sort of the traditional monolithic application stacks. Um, primarily, I've talked to customers that are dealing with some sort of a workload that falls into one of these buckets. That, that type of infrastructure really assumes, or that type of application stack assumes a highly available infrastructure and a highly performant infrastructure underneath. Some of the newer applications and, and application stacks, I'm just kind of drawing attention to the fact that there is this change of software going toward microservices development and we're supporting companies that are probably never going to do that. They're not going to rewrite the apps. It's cost prohibitive. It's unproven. Nobody's done it yet. So somebody has to stay behind and help them. And so that's our job. And our, and our job it looks, we look for this situation. I, this is not my graphic, so I just pulled this from the internet, whosoever it is, thank you. Um, this is the dream for any customer running one of those mission critical workloads. Mission critical means that if it goes away for any length of time, so does your company. That's important, that's an important application. So, without the cartoon, um, again, this is a small plug, this is what we do. Um, the company I represent, and, and we are built on a x86 architecture. We're built on a VMware vSphere x86 architecture. And so as I go through some of the architecture that we consider the mission critical platform, just keep that in mind. The gold box represents one of our data center nodes. Inside, you'll see different boxes labeled DMZ, internal zone, management zone, they all have a fairly obvious purpose, but the purpose of each of these zones, and they all do talk to one another, and they all talk to one another through firewalls, at least one. We, we would segregate workloads. So this is gonna be a, an area in our data center that would be more like uh, a, a, the more well-known cloud service providers. Their workloads would basically be here public facing, easy to access. The issue that we're dealing with with the customers that we primarily talk to is their applications are not forward facing. They don't need a DMZ. They need a solution that doesn't include internet access. Much of the time we'll spend is architecting for the internal zone. Applications, web servers, app servers, database servers from the list of characters that we just talked about. Now this architecture, all, all the networking, we have, we have options, we can give the customer, yes, we can sell back internet connectivity. It is important to recognize that. Some customers just want to connect to our data center node uh, with an MPLS circuit or some other type of peer-to-peer -peer connection, and they'll route all the traffic back over that to use their internet bandwidth. 
But we, the, the, the point of that is, is the networking options are flexible. Um, you can extend your subnet ranges into our data center. It doesn't matter, you're isolated into a virtual routing and forwarding context that is either managed by us or managed by you. That's completely isolated from every other tenant. All right, so everything passes through either a trusted encrypted connection from the outside world or coming from the internet passes through intrusion detection at the perimeter and any internal traffic between zones goes through firewalls. The core networking is our Drake Passage, we used to call it, where the waters of South, uh, off the coast of South America, where the Pacific and the ocean come together and slam up. Well, that's kind of the core, it's taking a load. 10 gigabit, all, back, all of our backlane 10 gigabit. Um, we try to tier performance for our customers' applications, and my job as an architect would be to talk to a customer to find out what you truly consider to be a production application. Because what we've done is we've figured out that there are applications that need certain levels of business continuity, and there are applications that are really throwaway. Or in the case of a site disaster, they can be left behind because they don't impact the actual business. We focus on two different perspectives. And so what I want to be able to do is tailor my customer's performance profile of what I offer based on a certain expected outcome. And the, the storage tiers, um, none of the technology behind this should surprise you. Um, the storage tiers these days are more quality of service driven by software than they used to be with the actual physical media. But the bottom line is the higher the performance, the more it costs. Stands to reason. But I'll explain more about what a basic and core micro VMR, a couple slides. We do create an isolated environment. Again, just kind of showing the workloads finally onto the platform. The platform's implicitly secure and we deploy each of these nodes in pairs. And in the middle of the screen, I've got a, t a redundant 10 gigabit storage e-mesh uh, to do all of my customer replication across. That's storage-based, block-based storage replication. Um, the RPO and the RTO is the default RPO and RTO that we will agree to. 15 minute recovery point objective, 12, uh, two hour uh, recovery time objective. And that's for specifically the workloads that require that level of high availability. So we always deploy in pairs. This is one city and for example, our Las Vegas data center that could represent Sterling, Virginia. Now the issue is some of the customers that come on that are, that are uh, running their workloads on this platform are primarily running their workloads on the other end in Sterling. And they view Las Vegas as a DR site. So they're active active. And we're able to get a pretty good response across these networks. I, I know this is a bit of an eye chart. Um, the point of putting this up there really is to draw attention to we have a very large company that wanted to do testing. We, of course, um, agree to a tight RPO and RTO, but in reality, we can beat it. And that's, that's important to recognize that it's in hours and better because I think a lot of the customers I've spoken with have been used to days of, of time, weeks, to do, to do proper recovery. This is an important aspect of when an enterprise considers making the move to the cloud, is this particular item. And we've architected specifically to provide the ability to even have your backups replicated. So that backup zone that I showed you in previous slides, all the data is held here, encrypted. If you, as a customer, choose to have it re relocated to a secondary site, no problem. These are all, by the way, have I mentioned a technology or a concept yet that you're not familiar with? Everybody's pretty familiar with this concepts. That's the point. That's the point. I, I, I think when I'm with my, the, the technologists in the audience at any customer I speak to, if you're looking for a way to move those workloads based on the interest of a CEO or the interest of an enterprise architect, these are some valid considerations to make 
Also, customers require things on their tenant zone network that are completely separate from the network that we use to run and manage the, the IaaS platform. And those could be things like virtual firewalls, intrusion detection, antivirus, you get the idea, encryption, using uh, physical appliances to watch their VLANs, period. Just protect, the, protect their entire network. These are a la carte services that we provide because we can also do them ourselves in this management zone, which runs everything. And to give you some perspective, the management zone started in Las Vegas, sorry, the data center deployment and, and the SuperNAP uh, started at something like three racks of hardware, standard racks. The management zone is about half of one rack. So by the time I took a tour through it two years ago, two and a half years ago, we had over 100 racks. And we've only run out of space repeatedly. So the, the reason I'm saying that is the management zone is still a half rack of gear. And the reason it has a lock on it is because you don't ever get to access it, only we do. So there are certain solutions that I am faced with inevitably where customers want to try to deploy. I, we don't always see an immediate fit. Sometimes we can accommodate, sometimes not. Um, but the, any, any sort of solution that requires access to VMware's vCenter server, that's not going to happen. Now, does anybody know anything about the multi-tenancy capabilities of VMware's vCenter? That was a trick question. Trick question. Um, we have created some software to, to do exactly that, to essentially mask all this away and provide you a graphical interface from a publicly accessible domain to only you or only all of the admins at your particular organization. And then it's role-based access control, however you want to stratify access to the resources, i.e. the virtual machines, the templates, the network port groups. Certain individuals, certain groups of individuals can be tightly locked down even within a, a sub, a, sort of a sub view of the existing tenant. So, bring some enterprise controls, if you have cer certain security controls, network controls, governance controls, architectural controls, I probably am going to go through the wordy ones a little faster. Um, we're not saying we have all of these, we're saying we're capable of helping you. Your data is important, and, and we all know that we're in Europe, GDPR is a new attestation that must be complied with. Um, so, what we're saying is we know you have compliance requirements. You're in industries that require certain certifications of where you locate your workload, where you locate your data. We work with you to determine where that needs to be. And we, we work with you to, to, to figure out which compliance requirements you have based on what you're bringing to the platform. And then we help you pass your audits. We, we meet all the compliance controls to help our customer pass their audits, where we're liable, where we're responsible in the racing. The way, I, the way we sell our services is based on a terminology called core micro-VM, basic micro-VM. Um, if, you, uh, if you want the short version, core workloads replicate to a secondary site so that in the event of disaster, the two hour RTO, we can get you to the ability to bring up your apps. Um, recovery point objective, again, 15 minutes. But the micro VM, to be clear, isn't a virtual machine. It's a marketing name from days gone by that we'll probably end up sticking with. Um, it's a measurement. And we take that measurement every five minutes, all day long, every day, forever, for every workload that runs on our platform. And it's our platform, it's our software specifically that's taking these measurements. And it's allowing us to do something, it's an, interesting th it's an interesting concept. Most people are used to renting virtual machines in their entirety. Um, we're, we're looking at the full capacity of the platform and we're subdividing it in the form of these measurements and we're selling renting measurements, essentially. We're guaranteeing an outcome for your application's performance. Um, we're also using that internally for capacity planning purposes. And so these are, these are our measurement increments. 
So everything that's on our platform, i.e. all the servers, the CPU cores, the RAM, it's all totaled up, divided by these increments. That's our capacity that we can sell back to you. And as a customer, you, pay, you can pay list price for a micro VM, or you can work with us to figure out a way to get a discount on the micro VM, like every other vendor. These are all measured at the hypervisor level. It's a cr critical point when I've dealt with our, our cloud service provider partners who've adopted our software and reference architecture. Um, names all over the world you probably are familiar with. One of the things the, the smart guys in the room always figure out is that we are measuring at the hypervisor level and not directly from the virtual machine, simply because, as you all know, that's where the accuracy of what's truly available comes from. And that's important. Uh, much of the time, this is a graph from one of our tools that actually shows the, the on-site, in-place, on-premises servers consumption of the following four resources, CPU, RAM, network I.O. within the cloud, and storage IOPS. A lot of times I see uh, CPU as the leader. When I run this analysis, a lot of times I see memory. But that's usually the two culprits and primarily in the VMware space, it's memory. So what we're doing is, in, in my mind, I would suggest um, an instant way to work with us is to, if your servers are always going to be powered on, then commit to whatever level is right below that peak, the biggest chunk of, and anything above when it spikes, we're measuring every 15 minutes, all micro VMs are based on a different price because of the negotiated commitment up front. There's far more detail, obviously, but. Um, some people assume the way this works is a little bit different, so to give you an idea, I, I start out with a, a virtual machine and you know, maybe at, at a five minute interval it was 600 megahertz. So three micro VMs, right, 200 megahertz. I can do math. Three micro VMs of CPU, four micro VMs RAM, and so on. So what we are concerned about is the largest number, okay? So the, the bad assumption is in the right-hand side, and it's the tendency all people make is to total this, these values up mentally by the virtual machine. So what if I have more VMs? The concept is identical. Frankly, the more you bring to us, it's an aggregate average. Aggregate average. So I have m multiple workloads, multiple measurements taken, We've figured out which is the biggest, obviously, of all the four per VM. Turns out it's 21 micro VMs. So the assumption is I got to pay for that, 21 micro VMs. In reality, what we're concerned about is the vertical, the overall aggregate. Your individual company on my platform, whatever count virtual machines that is, in aggregate, what is the aggregate CPU, RAM, and I.O.? And that's what we charge for, the largest of those four. No waste. You don't have to over-provision servers. You don't even have to over-provision and over-buy virtual machines anymore. You bring us the configuration, whatever the application requires, whatever the ISV suggests. You follow industry be best practices, bring us the config. We architect it with you backup strategy, network strategy, security strategy, disaster recovery, compliance, or some major conversations based, and you may not be the type of customer I typically talk to. I have a feeling some of you are. Um, it's, a, it's a concerted effort, and we are there as a representative of the greater uh, technology of fa family of technology companies to help, so. At any rate, uh, further stratified into our services. I mentioned basic and core. This is where it comes back. Um, and, and so what we're doing is we're just tallying up the usage of, of all of the different components, the resource pools, the network port groups, the, the, the VMFS, and we're trying to figure out where you're using the most. That's all we care about. And if those virtual machines are basic, they stay in the event of a failure. If they're core, the VMs will be up in two hours, okay? Now, 
Single site, dual site, this is, this is how we represent it all. I boil it down to single site, dual site, but there is one more critical aspect because we are talking about the applications <laughs> that are the crown jewels of most clients. Um, they're gonna require a certain level of commitment that that data will be there, and if not, service credits are gonna be paid and they're gonna be a stiff penalty for outage. So enterprise core workloads, which tend to be the most transactional or the most um, heavily relied upon workloads will typically be enterprise core, as you can expect. And something critical to note as well, on both of those data centers, since both, at both ends, there are customers that consider that live primary, right, and the other, the DR site, we make reservations not like the vCenter reservations you're thinking of, but we make allowances for the fact of how many core workloads are here or here so that we can fail over and those workloads will come back up within two hours and be able to serve the operating system and ultimately the application. That's, a, that's an agreement, not an objective. That's a business, a contractual agreement. And obviously it's an important factor. So this is, a, this, is a, this is an acknowledgement to the fact that I'm not saying any platform is wrong. I think we've all got the understanding it's really based on the use case. And the use case starts with what type of, is it a next generation application? Those applications aren't at all like these that we're mostly managing today. Those are written for architectures that don't even exist or are rare to find in some cases. Um, the new applications elastically scale, auto scale, they understand how to do things that certain vendors have, haven't gotten there yet. So it's, a, it's really, do you want to build it and manage it? Or do you want to consume it as a service? Because you don't have to build it and we can manage it. So when people ask me what VirtuStream is, and what our enterprise cloud is. These are kind of the four things I think to tell somebody in an elevator or escalator. Um, it's the platform of record. It's, it's designed for systems of, um, this is the system of engagement. And this is primarily what our competitors are, writing, are, are supporting. Um, developers that write applications for this, or web, we're, we're different. We're, we're handling the actual system of record, so it's important to, to maintain business continuity standards for that software. Um, the economics we think are superior. Consume as a service. Same principle with pulling out your phone and requesting a car. I only want to pay for a certain amount. I don't want to pay for the car. I don't even want to rent the car for a month. I just want the car for right now. And I think this method is going to actually start to change the way we approach DR and I think it's going to change the way that we uh, approach services, the actual applications that are served out to the client. Thirdly, we're a managed services company. We have an IaaS. Our, our managed services team focus on primarily two application stacks today. For the longest time, it was just one application stack, um, SAP. Now we've added Epic, the healthcare medical health records company. And um, the managed services around that are the people, the expertise. Finally, security. Since we're talking about, again, the crown jewels, the important, the important applications, we are maniacal about security. Two-factor authentication on the, on the UI, on the public, public domain. Every, every single bit of traffic flows through a firewall into and out of the management zone, even for our own people. So, again, I tried to not make it a big commercial. I hope I was successful in that, and I appreciate you guys listening. Any questions? Thank you.